Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Retirement Cafe podcast, which is brought to you or sponsored by the Timeline app. Timeline is that retirement income planning software that helps financial planners like me bring your retirement journey to life and answer your big retirement income questions. Now, this episode is the second in our series on dealing with death. You may remember I spoke with author and end-of-life doula Judy Kaufman last week in episode 66. It's almost impossible to reach some way into adulthood without experiencing the loss of a loved one. And I think it's fair to say that each of us deals with death in a different way and as our own way of grieving. For some, grief can be totally crushing and incredibly difficult to deal with. My guest today knows firsthand what it's like to lose someone dear to her. Amy's experience set her off on a lifelong mission of helping people deal with grief. Here to talk about her experience and the work of her company called Genius and how they do this, how they deal with this complex and emotional area is author and speaker, Amy Florian. Thank you for joining me, Amy. You're welcome. I'm delighted to be here. So, Amy, um, for those who may not know you, could you let us a li- tell us a little bit about yourself and your company called Genius, and also, uh, you know, your personal story about how this um, how this wonderful company came into being? Sure. Um, well, first of all, I had no clue that I would end up working in the field of thanatology, which is it's broadly. I'm an expert in death, loss, grief, aging, and transition. All those topics that, as you so aptly said, people think they're so dreadful and uncomfortable, but that's only because they don't know how to handle them or how to heal or how to support the people that they care about. It's, it's really life-giving yeah. to get to help people heal. But as I said, I didn't intend to be in this profession. I sort of backed into it. When I was 25 years old and the proud new mother of a seven-month-old baby boy, my husband, John, was killed in a car accident. My world, my dreams, my identity, it all shattered. (laughs) And in the the little rural town where I grew up in the Midwestern United States and where John and I lived, no one knew what to do or what to say. It, it wasn't that I didn't have people who loved me. I have nine brothers and sisters. <laughs> and in a small town, mm-hmm. everyone knows everyone. Everybody wanted to help. It's just that no one had ever been taught. All they could say was those really unhelpful phrases like, oh, I'm so sorry for your loss, or God has his reasons, or don't worry, you're young, you can marry again. Or, mm-hmm. oh, he's in a better place now. Or, Oh, Amy, he wouldn't want you to cry. I mean, I could go on and on and on. It just wasn't helpful. But I was determined to heal because my son didn't have a father. He darn well better have a mother. Mm. So as I healed, at first, just informally, I, I was turning around and helping other people with what I had learned, with what I had learned, with the, the, wisdom I gained by really uh, focusing on healing through my own grief. And then several years after John died, I was asked to participate in a seminar on on grief and loss. And as as soon as one group heard me, another group wanted me and another group wanted me. So eventually I went back to school. I earned advanced education so I could back up my own learning with a language to describe the experience and the academic foundation underneath it. I founded a support group for widowed people that I still facilitate today. I started teaching on both graduate and undergraduate levels. It just kept going. I've worked with over 2,000 sick, dying, and grieving people. Wow. Um, And Amy, what was, um, you know, if you look back on that, you know that tough time that you were going through when when uh, when you lost your husband um what 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 were the things that really helped you move through that period of grief well one thing was i was determined to face it what we are taught in our especially in western society 
we are taught to suppress it, ignore it, deny it. I mean, we th we can't even say the words. You know, people people don't say, "My mom died." They no. say she passed away. She's transitioned. She's um, in in the UK. I hear you say "carked it" or "snuffed it." That. Uh, <laughs> that she's six feet under, she's pushing up daisies, she's our dearly departed, she's gone home, she's gone to her rest, hopefully resting in peace, by the way. Um, that yeah. We have all these euphemisms, we can't even name the word. You know, it didn't used to be that way. Um, say a century ago, families stayed in the same area, sometimes in the same house, and they cared for their loved ones who were sick or who were old or who were dying. And kids were exposed to it. Everybody was exposed to it. Death was accepted as the natural, normal, expected part of life. Mm. But as we became more mobile and moved away from each other and couldn't take care of our own, and as we developed things like antibiotics that extended the lifespan and helped us think that we didn't have to die, and as we developed all these technologies so that when people were sick, they really can't be cared for well unless they're in a hospital. And when they're aging because the family isn't around or it's just too stressful, we need nursing homes and assisted living. And none of those things are bad things. They're all good and they're all necessary, but we have to face the fact that what it did to us is we outsourced death. Yeah. Even in my graduate classes, many people have never really seen a dead body, much less touched one, and they have no clue what happens from the time the person dies until they're laid out nicely, you know, if they're, if they're of that religious tradition anyway, if they're laid out nicely in the funeral home or whatever we've outsourced death we don't we don't know how to face it so i was no. determined to heal and one of the things i did was face my grief head on i went to places that we used to go to but i went there alone i did things we used to do did them by myself i would say the words to myself john died he's not coming back. I read yeah. everything I could get my hands on. And I looked for people who, who understood people who got it. So many people don't. Right. Grief takes a long time. It's very complex. And sometimes all you need is somebody to just listen or sit with you. But there, those people are few and far between. So I really... Yeah went after my grief and was determined to heal. I wrote in journals. I did everything that I could to try to help myself heal. And I looked for the people that could help me do that too. Mm. Now, I understand that um, your uh, core genius, your company mm -hmm. is a training organization that is helping advisors or people, you know, other organizations helping them deal with people with grief. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know, grief happens to everyone approach, I think is one of your lines. Yeah. Um, tell me, tell me about how, how do you, how do you go about training someone to, to be, to, you know, in, in to, to facilitate this in a better way? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, your point about grief happens to everyone. People don't understand that grief is not just from a death. That's what everybody thinks of. If you're grieving, somebody must have died. But mm. actually, grief occurs whenever there's a break in an attachment. Whenever you have to leave behind someone or something that you cherish or a way of life or a function, an ability to do something or a dream or a status, anytime you have to leave behind something you like about your life, you're familiar with it, you want to continue that way, but you have to leave it behind and go forward and learn how to live without it, that triggers grief. Yeah. So of course, death triggers grief. So does divorce. 
so does having a child born with disabilities or acquiring a disability yourself. So does moving to a new place, leaving behind your neighborhood and your friends, or going to a new job and leaving behind your coworkers. Actually, even positive transitions trigger grief. When somebody, a, a couple has a baby. Yes, wow, this is what they've wanted. They have a baby. But don't you just wish you could sleep through the night once in a while? <laughs> Don't you wish you could go to the grocery store without carrying a minor U-Haul? Don't you wish you could just spontaneously go out to eat like you used to without having to plan two weeks ahead to get a babysitter? You know, there's things you have to leave behind even as you're going to something new. Yeah. So positive and negative transitions. Everyone is a both and. In every single one, there are things that I'm grateful for or relieved for or or happy about and at the exact same time there's things i miss there's things i have to let go of things i long for things i grieve so it helps when we're when we're talking about training to deal with people who are grieving it's really very broad most of the people you know are grieving right now <laughs> They're grieving over yeah. little things. They're grieving over big things. So many, so many of the transitions and the leaving behinds of our lives, people are grieving and we just don't realize it. So the first yeah. thing people need to understand is that you got to open this up. People are grieving if they're experiencing infertility. They're grieving. If they can't be home for the holidays where they want to be, they're grieving. If their car gets totaled, they're grieving. If they retire, they're grieving. So open it up, apply it across the board. And then the first, the first things that we do um, in training people after opening it up is start talking about principles of grief support and because grief is this way, what do you need to do about it? What are your what are your principles to do it? And it's before we go farther, I did also want to say that uh, while Core Genius is focused mainly on professionals, the financial professionals, uh, advisors, estate planning attorneys, trust officers, uh, people in the legal and financial field, the first half, more than half of my career was actually not in that market. I was teaching healthcare, hospice, nurses and doctors, clergy. You know, clergy are not trained. They, they don't learn in seminary how to support people who are grieving or what is helpful or not helpful to say when there's been a death in somebody's family or when they're struggling in their, in their lives. They're really not trained about those things. So I had a very broad, and still do have a very broad uh, market. Everybody needs to know this stuff. I wish I could teach everybody in the world. <laughs> so everybody mm. needs to know this stuff. But my company, Core Genius, uh, was developed when I realized what a need there was in the professional sphere and put together the company to, to address that. Yeah. So I hope that answered you. Yeah. Added, you asked a lot of questions at at once, and I hope I answered each one of them at least partly. It it, it does, and it, and it and it leads me to 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 kind of drill down on the specifics a bit. Now I know that you're the author of two books, uh, "No Longer Awkward: Communicating with Clients Through the Toughest Times of Life," and "A Friend Indeed: Help Someone You Love When They Grieve." Now, I know as a financial professional that I have already experienced clients uh, dying and becoming uh, widowed at a young age. Um, and, you know, as a specialist in dealing with people with retirement, of course, just the very nature of the end of retirement is death. So I'm going to experience clients dying. Yes. And we have a very personal relationship with people we're not a transactional business we we get to know people and what their hopes and dreams are and 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 
you know, w- what they want to achieve in their lives. So, so we get a real connection. And, and I suppose that there's an element of grief when we lose. A client. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> Uh, and then, and then, of course, what we want to do is not only for be able to handle that ourselves. We want to, if there is a someone left behind or family left behind, we want to do a great job there in supporting them. Mm-hmm. So, I've never had training in this. I mean, I'm hopefully that I'm a reasonably empathetic kind of chap um, and would hope to, you know, do the right thing. But no, I haven't had any professional training in this area. And I, uh, as I say, I don't. I, this is why it's such a fascinating conversation for me. And then, of course, just on a personal level, you know, we uh, uh, I lost, um, you know, my, my father-in-law died um, a year or two back. And um, and again, you know, again, supporting my wife and, you know, and, and then also understanding what happened, you know, how that would affect me as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, th- this, is, this is really interesting to know. I mean, I, um, uh, I haven't read your books yet. They definitely will be on my... Uh, wish list um uh uh very soon to to read but for the listeners you know aren't we have a mixture of listeners i know there's quite a few financial advisors and financial planners who listen to this podcast but but also a lot of retirees um so what what would for those who haven't read the books etc what are the key messages that we could pass on yeah well first of all just a differentiation between the books the book No Longer Awkward is aimed at professionals, at the uh, specifically mm. at financial professionals in the broad sense of that word. Um, then some advisors told me they were buying No Longer Awkward and giving it to their clients because it had such good information in it about grief. That's when I wrote A Friend Indeed. That's the one for anybody everywhere. It's just for, right. for any person right. Uh, financial professionals now are buying that and giving it to families. And I titled it that way, A Friend Indeed Helps Someone You Love When They Grieve, because anytime there's a death in your client's family, they're not the only ones who are grieving. Their whole family is grieving. Their parents are grieving. Their friends are grieving. Their kids are grieving. So many people are grieving. So it makes it very uh, very easy and non-intrusive to say, here's a book for your whole circle so that you can all learn a little bit about grief to be able to help each other through it, maybe a little bit faster, maybe with a little less pain, but here's something for all of you. It's not like, here, you need a book about your grief because people don't, especially in our death-denying society, they don't like that. So that's the difference between the two books. The one is really aimed at the professional and the other one is aimed at people. Yeah. Then the key messages, um, first of all, lose all that unhelpful language that our society has taught us. So many phrases, you know, we started out with that. Lose all of that and instead learn how to, number one, ask good questions. It's so much more important to ask good questions than it is to tell the grieving person either something about yourself or something you think they ought to be doing. Is it, your job is not to fix it. You can't. And your job is not to cheer them up. Your job is to companion them wherever they are. So be truly present. Be there for them and invite them to tell their story. It, in the initial instance, they need to tell their story. A long time down the road, they need to tell their story. There have been times where um, someone will be talking to me and say, oh, well, when my dad died three years ago, and I'll say, oh, did he die suddenly or was it a long illness? I have never yet had anyone who didn't start telling me about their dad. We need to tell the story. Likewise, Mm. concentrate on memories and stories. Your wife's father died. Honey, what do you hope people remember about your dad? What what that you learned from your dad do you hope we can teach our own kids or that passes on down through the family? What was 
what was really special or valuable about his wisdom in his life. Tell me about a, a holiday memory you have of your dad. Now, the stories and the memories, even at the services, to come in and say, you know, I really enjoyed working with you and Karen all these years. And one thing I'm going to remember about Karen for the rest of my life was that big, infectious smile. Man, she knew how to make people happy. She'd walk in a room and pretty soon everybody's smiling. We're really going to miss her smile. The stories and the memories are what's really important. And you mentioned, too, everybody grieves in their own way. Not just in the way that you think they ought to, not just in the way that you grieve. There's different styles of grieving. There's so many factors that go into how we grieve. And there's different depths of grief depending on the situation. Somebody who, like me, my husband kissed me goodbye and never came home. I got slapped upside the face with the fact that he died. But somebody has Alzheimer's and they're sick for 12 years and then they die. That's a different type of grief because you started your grief a lot sooner. You started your grief when you got the diagnosis. And you've been letting go inch by inch by inch. So the grief afterwards is still significant, but it's not as uh, complicated or long term as somebody who gets slapped upside the face. So everybody grieves in their own way. Be there for them for the long haul. And the best thing you can do is be present and companion them wherever they are instead of telling them where you are or telling them what they ought to be doing. Is that helpful? Yeah, really helpful, really helpful. So um, do you think there is, um, well, you know, the, the, a lot of the clients that I'm dealing with have been together because we're dealing with retirees. They've, they've often been with their partners for a long mm -hmm. time you know uh, married for 40 50 yes. years you know that's it's just huge yeah. um and then possibly move into a life where they're on their own yeah. for you know maybe even 10 15 years um after being a couple for that length of time is there um what, what how do you feel about that transition i mean that grieving process there they Anytime a partner dies, it's a significant grief because people are invested in that relationship. It's one of the deepest attachments they can have. Mm. When, a, when that person dies, every breath the survivor takes all through the day is different from the time they wake up and reach across to that empty pillow, go down and have coffee for one, bake some scones and have no one to eat them with, see something in the newspaper or uh, uh, something on the internet and say, oh, honey, did, oh, we have to, one, one phrase I like to use is that we have to unlearn the expected presence of the other. It's the times when we would expect them to be there. Those are the hardest to let go of. And it takes a very long time to do that. People, people really grapple with having to let go of these times when they expected the other person to be there, when they treasured them, or to use what I said before, those things they were so attached to, to let go of that. It's very, very difficult. At the same time, there's a flip side to it that as people grieve, and they're not ready to do this in the beginning, but as they come to grapple and cope with their new life, they can also discover a lot of things about themselves. Most couples have something that they would have liked to do or someplace they would have liked to go or a class they would have liked to take, but they didn't because they were married and that wasn't the interest of their partner. Now they can. There is an element of adventure 
in discovering who you are as a single person. It's not that you would ever, ever, ever wish for the death to have happened in order to discover these things about yourself, but it happened. It happened and there's nothing you can do about it. So what now? It takes a long time. As I said, don't stuff it down. Allow the tears. Tears, actually, there's physiological chemicals in tears that relieve stress. <laughs> it's part of our stress relief mechanism. So, for instance, right. if you're in the office and your client is crying over something they're grieving for, allow those tears because they'll be actually better able to talk afterwards. They've gotten rid of stress chemicals. It's very healing. I would tell them to be very patient with themselves. Significant griefs like that, that's not over in a week or a month or a year. This is a good point, too. For many widowed people, the second year can actually be harder, or at least harder, hard in a different way. Because the first mm. year, every time you turn around, you're stealing yourself for the next first, the first anniversary, the first birthday, the first holiday season, the first Valentine's Day, the, the first, the first, the first. Every time you turn around, you're letting go of something else, something else, something else. And by the time you reach the first anniversary, you've done a lot of letting go, but you haven't done a lot of building something new. You still don't know who you are without that person. You still haven't discovered your purpose in life or why you're still alive, even though they've died. Those things yeah. take time. But by the time we reach the first anniversary, then all the support disappears. Then people think you ought to be over it. What's the matter with you? It's a year and a half. You haven't gotten over this yet. Let's take you to a doctor, get you some medication. No, people let go gradually over time and they heal at the same time. It's just that, well, one, another way that I like to put this is at first, everything goes gray. It, the tears, the sadness, the loss is just about everything you can see. And then you have these little moments where you catch yourself smiling or, or you're able to enjoy something or you laugh. And those things are what sustain us through that really dark time. Sometimes people feel that they're being disloyal to the person who died if they allow themselves to laugh or be smiling or, or be happy. That's not disloyalty at all. That's what you need to sustain yourself. And then over time, the sadness and the crying decrease while the happiness and the smiling and the laughing increase. Eventually, the things that brought tears, they eventually bring smiles. Eventually, the times of sadness and crying are just the little things that happen as you're going about your more full and active living instead of the thing that defines you. And that's, that's kind of what healing is like. But we never forget. That's not the point. Healing doesn't mean you forget. You take that person yeah. with you for the rest of your life. You take their life with you. You take their love with you. That never dies. You take who you have become. And I'm a different person because John loved me. And nobody can ever take that away, no matter how long it is. So on occasion, for the rest of your life, you will sometimes get ambushed. Sometimes you'll just get caught off guard and those tears will break through again. That's okay. That's normal because we're not supposed to forget. We carry them with us. Even as mm -hmm. we process the grief, the tears diminish. They don't happen so often anymore. and we gain a life that is very different than what we had planned, but that can still be filled with great satisfaction and peace and joy. Joy is possible. Healing is possible. You can't see it right away, but you can get there. Wise words. Wise words, Amy. Now, um, 
I'm sure lots of listeners are going to like to know how they can find out more about your books and the work Congenius is doing. Where, where can they find out more about you, your books, and, 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 and Corgenius? Sure. Well, our website is corgenius.com. C-O-R, core, is the Latin root for the word heart, and genius is brain. Our tagline is adding heart to the brains of business. So corgenius.com is all about what we do, and there's some videos, there's a lot of information, we have a blog. Uh, the two books can be ordered from our website. They're also readily available on Amazon. Um, I currently, people ask me a lot if I, if I do one-on-one -on -one coaching or advising or counseling. I don't do that right now. I simply don't have time. I, I travel all over the country and beyond. Um, trying to spread this necessary education wherever I go. And by the way, I do welcome opportunities to speak at conferences and events in any country. I've been to Australia three times now, so I'm familiar with the UK. I always right. try to help whenever and however I can. So people can contact Brilliant. me, check out the website, check out Amazon. Brilliant. Well, Thank you so much for that. Um, so to to find out more about the work Core Genius does and about Amy and her books, we'll put all those links on the show notes um, on our website at theretirementcafe.co.uk. Uh, and then you can find also the links to any other episodes in the series. If you've enjoyed this episode, then please do leave a review on iTunes by searching for the Retirement Cafe podcast or subscribe so you'll never miss an episode. Thanks again, once again, to Timeline App for sponsoring this podcast. You can find out more about Timeline at thetimelineapp.co. So until next time, this is Justin King helping you feel more informed in your retirement.